actually one of the harder topics of your four lectures. Alright, so um, I'll just start off with the most painful one, which is special relativity. Oh, but, 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 don't worry, don't worry. I'll make it very simple. Because I've only been investigating like long time, basically, firstly, time dilation, and secondly, back contraction. Okay, before we start, right? Uh, yes, and it's quite useless in everyday life because we don't deal with very extreme cases. However, astro is not everyday life. You know, right? We deal with very high speeds, extremely high temperatures, etc. Et and in that cases, your classical mechanics do not like, work anymore because they are only an approximation at very low velocities. Huh? And so, firstly, law, right? The first law, and the only law, really law the speed of light is constant regardless of your frame of reference. Huh? Which means that if you are stationary, you have zero velocity, you shine a light, you'll see the light traveling at speed C, which is 3 times 10 power A. Um, if you are traveling at 0 0.9, the speed of light, and you shine a light, it'll still look like, um, it'll still be C, which is 3.0 uh, times 10 power A. So the speed of light does not change no matter how fast its source is traveling up in the way. And the more laws which are unimportant, the more they so firstly, the time dilation, right? So the faster something travels, the slower time passes for it, lah. Which, okay, um, to the very further, right? Basically, it means that if you are traveling faster, the time that you measure, right, for your own duration, will be shorter than that of the time measured by an observer that's stationary that has a relative velocity. To so the shortest amount of time that will be measured is when you are moving along with the object, lah. And your divide your uh, yeah, speed is also um, So to derive the time dilation equation, right, you have to consider two cases up here. Firstly, it's your stationary frame, in which the observer has no velocity at all. So uh, let's imagine we have a laser here with a velocity V uh, that's traveling towards your right up. And you have an infinitely long screen, so you can ignore that. It's just for reflection. So if let's say the uh, laser right is emitting a light beam and you can see the light beam and you can trace it out, right? It'll look something like a triangle. Agreed? Okay. So next, we have the other case in which you are moving along with the laser. So what you will see, right, is that the light beam will move up and it'll move out, like vertically, because there's no relative velocity between you and the laser beam up. So there will only be the vertical component of the velocity that you have. Next, uh, if we look at the distance traveled by the light beam, right? Yeah, I'll just the track thing you realize that the distance traveled by the light beam, uh, as observed by this observer that is not moving, right, will be longer than that observed by this observer, right? However, we know that the speed of light is constant in both cases, which technically means that the time taken for this, right, will be actually longer than this. However, what is observed, right, is that let's say both observers will um, observe that the light beam will be emitted at the same time and you will come back at the same time. Which means that, uh, technically, in classical mechanics, that will mean that your duration of time right, is the same, but it's not. Of course, the speed of light is, is the same, but your displacement is not. Uh. And I'll skip all the math, but basically, if you use Pythagoras to, to calculate the displacement up, uh, and then you equate the speed of light to find the relationship between the durations for, as mentioned in this frame of reference, and as mentioned in this frame of reference, you will get the following equation, this, this equation up. Uh. So delta t prime is your observe, um, the duration measured in the for the observer which is not moving, and delta t naught is the duration measured by the observer moving along with the laser. So delta t naught right is known as the proper time because you are moving along with the laser and therefore you have no relative velocity with respect to that object. Uh. And also uh, one one over this group thing right is the law inspector. So um, just do that. Okay, so that's math now for now. So time dilation right there are two applications uh, which are quite common. Firstly is your it's calibrating your GPS uh. You know that your uh, GPS right it works by something like along the lines of having three satellites pinpointing one uh, place for coordinates. Uh. I'm not an expert in that field so I'm not very sure if this is very accurate but it goes along that line. However it uh, it has to calculate like how fast you are traveling and um, as well as your coordinates are. But these are all affected by the fact that the satellite itself is moving at a very, very high speed. Although not technically relative speeds, but given time, right, 
the pinpointing will be uh, more and more imprecise. Huh? And like um, time dilation is one of the quantities, uh, sorry, one of the phenomena that it, uh, that scientists who take charge of this will take into account when calibrating. The next is uh, okay, it's not exactly an application, but at an explanation. Yeah. So you know that particle physicists right, they like to observe particles coming in from like outside uh, from the universe. And uh, given the very, very short half-lives of these particles, uh, we'll expect like a very, very small amount of particles to be, de to be detected when it comes down into the detector on Earth. Uh. However, what scientists realize right, is that um, they detect a lot more particles than normal, uh, which, is a co uh, which, explains, uh, which is explained by the time dilation effect because the half-life is, um, because the half-life right, applies to the atomic uh, particles in their frame of reference are not in hours. Okay, so next, that's contraction. Still a bit more math, huh? so please, uh, bear with me. So, um, the general uh, observation right, is that for the proper frame in which you are not moving with the object, huh? so you're stationary with respect to the object, right? you measure the longest length, whereas anything else that has a relative velocity to the object will measure the length like a lot shorter. So to derive that, again, we need two different cases. Firstly, the rest frame, uh, like the observer that's not moving. We have a laser that's moving towards the right at a velocity of, of V, and also a screen that's moving along with the laser. So these two move together. So let's say if you emit a laser beam, uh, it will travel something like this. Okay, and um, the displacement travel will be just L prime, which is the distance between the laser beam and the screen. This V right, is your velocity, yeah, and delta T prime, uh, T1 prime is the time taken for the laser beam to reach here. There's this extra term here, right, which accounts for the fact that this thing is moving while the light beam is moving up. So by the time the light beam reaches the original position of the screen, right, this, okay, no, sorry, the mirror, the mirror will have moved a bit, uh, and the light beam will have to move a bit more to uh, catch up to that screen, in a sense. And the same also applies when it comes back, when it gets reflected back, which is this case and it has a statement of L prime minus V and uh, we did, yeah. The it's the same logic. Uh. Whereas in the other frame where you are moving the laser, right? This one is very simple. Uh. So you just see the laser moving away and then coming back. Okay, so um, this displacement will have uh, the displacement of the light beam will be two times L more. And if we again equate the speed of light. And but this time applying the time dilation equation, right? You get this thing up. I'll just keep the math. Here. So you get this equation where L naught is your proper length, so that's your longest length. Then this is your inverse, no, it's not inverse, it's the reciprocal of your gamma factor. But basically, you can see that as your velocity increases, this thing becomes smaller and smaller, right? So the length observed by an observer that has relative velocity to that object will be smaller than that measured by an observer that's moving along with the object. That is basically the gist of this equation. And uh, just a note, right? This length contraction only applies to lengths measured in the parallel direction of the motion, uh, which means that if I'm walking this way, right, and if I'm traveling at 0.9c, uh, like perpendicular to my direction, there will be no length contraction observed at all, no matter how fast I travel. <coughs> okay, so other things that will change along with your velocity are there will be uh, will include mass. Uh, force, kinetic energy, momentum, and basically anything that changes along with time, length, or mass. Next, yay, we have cleared the most painful section. Okay, now let's take a look at something fast, but that's relatively not a relatively skill. So basically, it means that if you are sitting on a rocket, of this thing here. So basically, it means that the sum of the momentum of this two will be as in, in vector form, which means that this, the momentum of this minus this must be equal to the momentum of this by conservation of momentum. And then we do some, we perform some magic, and you get this out. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kirkus and Mike, just, just know that it's, uh, just know that it's like, uh, by integration of, like for the DM, you get something like this. So where your change in velocity, right, is essentially equals to your relative velocity times the natural log of the, initial, the ratio of the initial velocity, uh, initial mass to your final mass. What this means, right, is that let's say you want to double your change in velocity, now. What you need is four times the ratio of the masses, which is quite inefficient, as I'll mention, as I'll say later. So, 
Okay, before I go into proportion, right, I have to tell you that the equation that I derived was only for ideal cases, huh? which means that we assume that there are no forces acting on the rocket, like, and the relative of exhaust force is constant. These are the two major assumptions by dynamic law. And however, despite the limitation, right, this is a very important equation huh? because it serves as a base for further derivation, which includes other, uh, which takes into account of all the forces, which you can do if you want to. Okay, so um, this is a slight adaptation of that equation with gravity accounted for. However, it is also a scam. Uh, there's also some limitations to it. Anyone can tell me what limitation, apart from the fact that it doesn't have the air resistance. See? I'm going to say if we have to It's because it's not that dangerous. Uh, the limitation is with regards to this term. No? Um, okay, I'll just say that. Basically, right, you know your G, right? It's your gravitational acceleration. However, as your rocket leaves off, like, there's a very significant radius, right? This gravitational acceleration will be different, uh, it will change as you move further and further away from it. Uh, you cannot take it as a uh, constant. Uh, and, uh, but if you want to take into account of that, it will be very difficult. So I didn't do it. Okay, uh, okay. propulsion, no math. Yeah, so. Yes. So for fuels, right, astrophysicists will, uh, for the chemical fuels, uh, they have to fit uh, two criteria. Okay. Basically, what they do is the reaction they will increase the pressure within the chamber to provide the velocity for the exhaust to come off. So there are two ways to do this. First, is that your reaction produces more moles of gas and basically increases the pressure of your chamber. So it produces more particles, uh, most is just a So it produces more particles of gas like, over the course of the reaction and therefore increasing the pressure within the chamber. This one, uh, you guys can imagine, right, if you have two particles within the room, the repulsion between them is very low. Whereas if you have 100, 1,000, 1 million, right, the repulsion will be much bigger. Lah. And that is one of the reasons why it increases pressure. Why there's an increase in pressure when you produce more moles of gas particles. Next is that the reaction is exothermic, aka it releases more heat. So when you increase heat, you know your gas will expand, lah, which is it's not, it's not the reason why your balloon pops at very high temperature. Okay, yeah, it is. So, um, basically by increasing temperature, you will uh, increase the pressure within the chamber, which further adds on to your increasing pressure. And for this, and fitting these two criteria, right, we have one of the most common fuels used up, which is our hydrogen peroxide fuel. And it basically converts chemical, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot to move this again. It basically converts chemical potential energy into the kinetic energy of your exhaust. What? Oh. Okay, it has high compressibility because it is liquid. Yes, not exactly high compressibility. No. And it's also the currently, uh, it's currently the most viable form of proportion. And this is basically the chemical equation that happens up here. Note that it's not hydrogen fuel, uh, it's hydrogen peroxide. So, um, this thing occurs at 650 degrees Celsius, uh, which is why your water produces, right? As in, the reaction will produce so much heat that the Reaction chamber reaches 650 degrees Celsius, or around there, which is why your water will reach a uh, geisha state. And it also produces oxygen, which is an interesting thing I'll say. And for the reaction to proceed very, very quickly, yeah. you need a uh, catalyst. Uh, and for this, uh, for most rockets, they use uh, sodium protagonate. Um, does anyone know what a catalyst does and how it works? For a Okay, fine, see it. So basically, um, it provides an alternative mechanism uh, or alternative pathway for this reaction to take place out, which basically requires um, more steps, and therefore, like at each step, right, there will be a low activation energy. Uh, therefore, the reaction will take place much faster. Yeah, that's the gist of it, but you can read up on that. The other chemicals also use like size. And basically, any compounds that will fit the previous two criteria that I mentioned. Apart from chemical uh, methods, right? They're also um, currently experimental uh, the nuclear, nuclear and using nuclear energy to provide energy for exhaust. But it is, I think, currently theoretical because our fuel saves uh, technology now are not like, sufficient to prevent uh, explosions from happening. Next, you have fire propulsion. Okay. This one, instead of, uh, it's quite different from, also quite different from chemical energy. Because instead of using uh, chemical energy to release heat and uh, produce that thrust, right, 
we are using electric fields and magnetic fields to accelerate the ions. And then uh, the magnetic field is used for directing the beam. You can't accelerate it in the same direction you can't do it. So the acceleration is primarily done by electric fields. So it accelerates the uh, ions and thrusts it out such that it has a very, very high velocity. And that also provides a uh, momentum change up, which is currently used in satellite propulsion. Lastly, you have your photonic propulsion, uh, which is which makes use of radiation pressure, which I will okay, uh, which I'll talk about later. So what this means, right, is that this thing, like you have a laser beam on us, and it will shine a very, very strong laser beam with, with very, very high frequency and intensity onto the rocket, and it will push the rocket up. That is only, however, theoretical. But there's an advantage to this, which is that there's no fuel required. Like, okay, I'll clarify. The fuel, right? First, to fuel in the rocket. You do not need fuel in the rocket for this thing to work. And fuels in the rocket is a very important item. Having no fuel is a very important advantage because the normal rocket, right? Let's say the rocket rises a certain height. Your energy uh, that's, ex um, that's used up to raise this height, right? Not only is for the rocket itself, the useful part that you rise the height, but also for the fuel to rise the height. So you're wasting energy bringing fuel up when you just when you don't even need it. Up in space up. So by using this, you can get rid of that uh, waste energy and conserve more energy. Up in way. Right, so now we're done with more kinematics. Right? Anyone can guess what I think this topic will be on? Look at it. It is a very common thing in everything, but you don't actually see it. Okay, fine. So, um, my next topic I will be on line up. Okay, uh, so in this topic, right, I will cover emission spectrum, uh, base displacement equation, as well as radiation pressure that I talked about as well. So for the emission spectrum, right, basically this is what you see. We pass the light through a beam, and you'll notice that instead of a continuous spectrum up, that you see probably for you know, right, you will see gaps in there. Yeah, and these are known as your absorption lines up. So yeah. You see this means that the wavelengths are absorbed by the elements within the star. However, uh, you'll probably be asking now uh, why these specific wavelengths are, why not other wavelengths? <coughs> so first you understand why the atom, okay, like, why the atom is like absorb this light up. Is firstly, right, let's take this hydrogen atom for example, ignore the scale. Um, this is the electron x bar state. So it's uh, orbiting the uh, uh, photon happily. Lah. And here comes the photon uh, dots, sorry. And it will be absorbed by the electrons, causing it to jump into a high energy level, aka excited state. So uh, if you learn it, uh, you probably learned this later in camp, that for an electron at an excited state, it will be quite unstable if it doesn't absorb further more energy. Lah. So what happens is it will drop back down. From an excited state, it will drop back down to a ground state. However, they will emit the photons in another, in another direction that was uh, absorbing them. That's uh, one of the reasons why we will not see these wavelengths, um, despite the fact that they emit photons when they drop back down. The second reason is because even if like the electron right absorbs um, the photons at one go, like um, the absorption right, of that photon at one go to reach the excited state, when it, drop back, when it drops back down, right, it's not necessarily a single drop, but rather it can also be a few drops at a time up, a few steps at a time, uh, time down the quantum states. So at each drop, right, it will release photons of other of longer wavelengths up, which is why you don't see the exact same uh, photons of <coughs> photons of the same exact wavelength. And therefore, um, this results in your absorption spectrum. Okay, for the specific, um, for the equation that characterizes that, I express this up. So your delta E is your difference in energy level of the electron, which is just a constant and F is your frequency. So for um, why it's so specific, right? It's because your jump in energy level for that atom, um, for each element is specific, uh, specific for them all. And so your frequency of the light absorbed, right, will also be very specific to each element. And therefore, with the emission spectrum, right, you can therefore um, know what elements are present in the star. Not only that, but with the intensity of the absorption and as well as the emission lights up. We are able to tell the proportion of the elements in the stars, which is very useful uh, for the true physicists. Okay, so next, the waste displacement constant. It's basically uh, sorry, displacement equation. It's basically a relation, uh, an equation that characterizes the relationship between the peak wavelength as well as the temperature of the star. 
And it is, uh, and this is the equation I'm expressing for. Uh, don't ask me how it's derived because I'm so slow. Uh, right. So with the information of the big wavelength, right, which can be obtained from your uh, emission spectrum as well as your uh, absorption spectrum, right? You know, the absorption spectrum is quite useless. The emission spectrum is the useful one. Uh, we will therefore, like applying this equation, we will therefore know the surface temp. Sorry, it's the surface temperature of the star. This T refers to the surface temperature of the star. So uh, next. Radiation pressure, right? Just now we were talking about the uh, um, laser propel. Uh, okay, right? This is essentially how it works out. So, this is the pressure that uh, is. This is uh, the pressure that is experienced by a refracting surface. This 2 here, right? Refers to. Uh, because of the momentum change, right? You know, when light, right? It hits the screen, then it reflects back. So, it's 2 times its uh, speed, right? Like, the change is 2 times its speed. And this <coughs> this thing, this term here, refers to the intensity of light. So you know what? As uh, the cosine square theta, right, uh, <coughs> helps to adjust for the angles of your beam up. So if it's not in right angle, this is what we we'll use to adjust. Otherwise, it's that's quite useless. Um, so you can see, uh, like, uh, qualitatively, it's quite logical that if you increase your intensity of light, your radiation pressure ex uh, experience will be also higher. We know that this is also not very significant in our life because the uh, main danger that the sun poses to us is not by crushing us, but rather by um, damaging our skin cells, etc. Et However, um, we have to factor this in uh, by performing calculations for the trajectory of um, spacecraft in space out. Because although the radiation pressure right, is quite minor, like, from, especially from the sun, um, in space there's you know there's no air, there's no drag, okay, very, 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 very little drag. Up. So there's no retarding forces that will help to contact against this pressure, which will cause, which means that if you do not calculate for it, right, your um, your spacecraft will get more and more skewed away from the trajectory that you plan up. And put it into perspective, like a spacecraft that's intended for Mars will miss its orbit by fifteen thousand kilometers if you do not calculate into, if you do not think into account of this. And these are the two programs that have been successfully uh, launched into Mars. Yeah, great. And also. And also took into account of this um, particular phenomenon. Next, right, uh, we have okay. Um, although the rocket one was theoretical, right, it's um, it's actually been experimentally proven up that radiation pressure like exists up. So, JAXA is your Japan, uh, your Japan version of NASA. So, it basically, it successfully unfilled uh, solar field, uh, solar seal, sorry, that's this thing in space, and as um been shown to be propelled out by the light's rays up. And uh, however, yeah, okay. however the difference right between this, like why this works and why the rockets one do not currently work right, is because in space the gravity that's exerted on the sail is quite um is not as significant as that on Earth, uh, as well as the fact that on Earth you have track. So your radiation, your radiation pressure that's required to push your rocket up would be a lot, lot more. Um, um, as compared to this one. And also another uh, part where radiation pressure applies right, is in the core of supergiant's heart. So in nuclear fusion, which I'll talk about later, the, there'll be photons in the like in gamma, form of gamma rays, etc. Et and this will form will cause a radiation pressure that will contact against the immense gravity that the star exists on itself and therefore prevents it from collapsing on itself. I mean, this is one of the forces that's responsible for that, but there are other forces as well. Right, now we have looked at light stand in darkness. What's my next topic? Yes, black holes, right? <laughs> okay, so first I'll go through the phenomena of black holes. And then the types of black holes, which I'm very proud of. Parts of black hole, and lastly, the scotial radius of the black hole. Okay, some phenomena. First, when you are on a black hole, time dilation also occurs up. As, um, Probably we will even extend uh, as compared to spectral and relative But uh, you can see where this is coming from. And this one you guys should probably know. Like, is that you get stretched when you approach the black hole. For those of you who don't know, this is because at a black hole, right? Uh, despite the fact that your body is like only like one point something meters, um, the difference in gravity experienced by your feet and your head will be so large that you get pulled apart. So you get stretched like 20 meters. Also, uh, the length of your stretching depends on how close you get to the you get Mars. 
And also you seem to disappear at the event horizon. Everyone knows why this is the case. Yes, right. Because light um, at a, the event horizon is defined at a, as a boundary, right? Which light is unable to escape. Uh. So if you are at that horizon and the light like sort of reflects off you, uh, doesn't reach the observer outside that because it can't escape the event horizon. So because light doesn't enter your eyes, you therefore cannot see uh, a person falling into a uh, past the event horizon. And lastly is gravitational density. Okay, uh, before I go into gravitational density, let's just talk about types of black holes. So these are the four types of black holes that are characterized by the presence of rotation as well as the presence of charges. Uh, anyone know of these four black holes? Which one was used to model the black hole in the It's called, it's called. Curl is the Um And also, FYI, right, the, for info, right, the, Photons that are moving around, like the glow light of the black hole, is actually modeled by one of the professors in NUSR. Yeah. Okay. So Singapore actually did something awesome. Okay, so now for gravitational lensing. This is caused right, by black holes distorting the space around uh, the cell half, which is why it is able to curve like around this body. And you know that, um, and this is, and that is thus bent or curved, and which is analogous to a lens refracting rays. You know, in the lens, right, because of the difference in refractive indices, uh, indices your light rays are bent. And this is uh, a similar idea. So, therefore, it's called gravitational lensing. But it's not exactly using a different material to uh, curve the light. And uh, its application is not, it's not only the uh, cool up, it's also used by astrophysicists right, to determine the distance between. The celestial object is gravitationally lens, as well as a uh, star. So if we know the mass, the its radius and its distance from us, right? And how much and to what extent, which is essentially this angle here, right? How much it is refracted in a way, we will be able to tell uh, how far away this thing is from this and therefore from us. And the phenomena is modeled by the general theory of relativity, uh, which I will not talk about because after the know. Okay, so for parts of black hole, right? Firstly, you have an uh, attrition disk, which is basically this mass, this very massive disk that's orbiting the black hole. Next, you have your ergosphere, which is basically your region that's significantly distorted. However, this applies only to rotating black holes, uh, and this is because, right? Yeah, let's give you an analogy. Let's say you have a cloth on the table, right? and this cloth is your space-time continuum thing, right? Then you put a fork in. You, you don't pull the fork, you stab the fork down and you twist it, right? You can imagine the cloth twisting around the fork arm. And that fork is essentially your energy to a black hole. So only when it spins, right, the ergosphere will be there. It will distort uh, way longer, like way past its... Uh, it, will, it will form this elliptical shape, basically. Okay, your photon sphere is basically a sphere where have photons of it. Uh, but it's not exactly just a circle of it, it's very complicated. And also your event horizon, uh, which you all know where uh, the escape velocity lab is speed of light, so nothing escapes it. It's also where Einstein's theories right, may break down. Uh, so because um, beyond the event horizon, right, there's the space inside there is so distorted and curved that, uh, that Einstein's theories uh, may not necessarily work. Like physics in general uh, may not necessarily work. And lastly, the most well-known one is your singularity, basically a uh, nearly infinitely dense point in the center of the black hole. Right, so now moving on to the scotial radius, right? <coughs> the scotial radius is the radius of the event horizon, basically the distance from the center to the event horizon. And as uh, a lot of you have mentioned, that the escape velocity is the speed of light of C. So, uh, by conservation of energy, right, which means that the kinetic energy required here for you to push yourself from your orbit to infinity, where you have zero potential energy, right? Um, is your half like this? This one you guys probably uh, quite familiar with, uh, This uh, kinetic energy formula. This right is your gravitational potential energy at the surface of the event horizon, because it is defined uh, by physicists, right? That at infinity, the gravitational potential energy is zero, right? Your kinetic energy basically effectively equals to your potential energy up. And you just rearrange the equation a bit, and then you get your famous Scotia radius equation. Lastly, what do black holes evolve from? Star. Yes, star, okay. Not all stars, but some stars. 
it will start. Okay, for stars, right, I'll just be talking about uh, nuclear fusion. Uh. So, nuclear fusion, right, basically provides the outward force to counter gravity and therefore prevents stars from collapsing as I mentioned before. Um, just a fun fact, right, apart from nuclear fusion, right, there's also electron degeneracy pressure, uh, which uh, is a quantum effect, uh, so I'm not going to do that. Um, okay, so, the energy produced is the thing that will keep the star from collapsing on the star. And this energy arises from this observation that the mass of a nucleus is less than the sum of the mass of its constituent uh, neutrons. Are. So let's say you have one neutron and one proton. Each of okay. Um, when you fuse this uh, neutron, neutron and protons together to form a nucleus, right? The mass will be less than um, the sum of the individual of the individual masses are. And this loss in mass right, becomes your energy application. Sorry, this is not an energy sign, it is a dash. So your loss in energy becomes mass. Oh, sorry, loss in mass becomes energy. And this is characterized by this equation, because it's very famous. And this energy is released in the form of photons. Uh, okay. So radiation pressure, right? Like basically, your. <coughs> Uh, from the wind's displacement uh, equation that we mentioned earlier, from the peak wave time and etc., right, you are able to determine this temperature, which is the surface temperature of the star, right? Remember? And this whole uh, expression here, right, is your expression for your radiation pressure of a star. So uh, this temperature, right, this high temperature, is due to your photons in the and also the high temperature at the core of your star as well. Okay. So this is one of the your starting pathways of. This is probably the primary reaction. So what you have right is two protons, which is your which are your hydrogen nuclei, fusing together to form a uh, deuterium neutron. Uh, deuterium nucleus. A deuterium um, deuterium is essentially an isotope of uh, hydrogen. And you have two of these occurring at the same time. Okay, not, not at the same time, but you basically produce two of this. And each of them fuses with another uh, hydrogen uh, nucleus to produce gamma rays, which is your light up essentially, which produces, which results in your radiation pressure. <coughs> and this um, fusion reaction will produce your helium three, helium three uh, nucleus up. And two of this will come together to form helium four nucleus and release two more hydrogen nucleus, which will go back to that unit. Thank you.